Recently, I've been hearing people in the music industry use a very strange word. In fact, this is a word I've never heard them use before, but in the last few years, it's showing up everywhere. And that word is algorithm. A few years ago, I never heard anybody in the music industry talk about algorithms. Now it sometimes seems that's all they want to talk about. Can music really be reduced to algorithms? Well, there's a great belief it can now. In fact, there's a belief that every aspect of music can potentially be reduced to an algorithm. They want to talk about algorithms that will help them pick which artist to sign. There are algorithms that will tell them which songs will be a hit and which will be a failure. Algorithms to advise the people that go to streaming platforms on what music they should hear. They're even talking about algorithms that will compose music. You even see situations in which people go to a concert and instead of seeing a live musician, they see this hologram recreation made out of all these various algorithms. You could see Billie Holiday or Roy Orbison or some other musician who's died constructed out of these various mathematical constructs. And this leads us to ask, is this good for music? because many people feel threatened. In fact, there's not a single job in the music world that can't, at least theoretically, be replaced by an algorithm. Now, it's interesting to note that we think this is a very current issue. We think this is a very modern issue. But in fact, the conflict between music and mathematics has been going on for 2,500 years. And it's recurred in very different ways and at very different points in the history of culture. Let's look at the first conflict between music and mathematics. This goes back to the era around 500 BC, and the instigator was a philosopher known as Pythagoras. Pythagoras is known for many things. You probably studied him when you studied geometry. But Pythagoras also is the person who understood that musical relationships and musical notes could be defined by numbers. He understood that if you took a string and you plucked it, you created a note. But if you changed the length of the string, you changed the note. And then he understood that there were specific ratios, that there was a whole science of this, and every note could be reduced to a number, and groups of notes could be reduced to scales which represented these ratios. We take this for granted now, but think of what a revolution that was. We tend to believe this was a positive revolution because our music now is mostly notated in scales. But in fact, this approach to music leaves out so much. Think of all the sounds that don't fit into these scales. Think of notes that bend the scales. Think of notes that don't exist within the construct of scales. Think of the whole world of sound that you could never reduce to a mathematical formula or a scale. So when Pythagoras created this new mathematical way of music, he also challenged everything else out there, and this challenge was frightening. This challenge was unsettling because this new notion of music was very devastating if you had any other view of how sound should create songs. People were probably threatened by this. Now, we don't have a lot of good evidence, but even what we have learned from the historical records is quite revealing. We understand that Pythagoras was forced to go into exile. Some of his followers were burnt. Other ones had to go into hiding, lead kind of secret societies. Now, nobody has linked this to the music, but I do believe that you find these revolutions are always threatening when they happen. It's interesting, the next great revolution in music and math came with an individual named Guido d'Arezzo. This is now 1,500 years after Pythagoras. But Guido is the person who invented musical notation. Think of this as the greatest algorithm in the history of music. You could now take any song and you could reduce it to a piece of paper. It's like a scientific formula for recreating a specific song. It's the very definition of an algorithm. Once again, this was controversial. There were death threats. Guido Torezzo had to leave his monastery. He was kicked out of the monastery. He had to go to the Pope for protection. He said there was a conspiracy against them. People hated him. Now, this seems very strange. Why would musical notation lead to death threats? But think about it. Before music was notated, if you wanted to learn a song, you had to go to someone who knew the song, a teacher. 
You had to go to a choir master. When musical notation came along, it threatened their people's lives, their existences, their vocations. They didn't want to see musical notation. No one would need them anymore. It's very similar to the situation now with the algorithm. So we shouldn't be surprised that the person who invented musical notation, who created this mathematical algorithm, created a situation of such controversy. But we've seen again and again throughout history this attempt to force music into mathematical formulas. Augustine wrote this great treatise on music. This is around the fourth century. And in it, he uses the word number, the Latin word numeri, for rhythm. Now, this is strange. Why would we use the word for number for rhythm? But this shows you the trend of thinking. And then you go up to the rationalist philosopher Leibniz, who said that music is just arithmetic. That when we're listening to music, our brain is counting. We're just not aware of it. You have the same thing with Schopenhauer, who believed that music was just an advanced form of mathematics. Now, this is where we get to the most interesting juncture in the story, when music fought back. When music fought back and said, no, you can't reduce all of this to mathematics. And the challenge came from Africa, because Africa had never bought into this Pythagorean revolution. In Africa, they never decided to reduce music to defined scales. They incorporated the whole world of sound into music. And when African music first came to the West, the musicologists were shocked because they could not write it down. They couldn't write it down. At the Columbian Exposition, they had these African performers and these famous American musicologists were shocked. They kept trying to notate just the rhythms. They were incapable of doing that. So all of a sudden, around the year 1900, you have this conflict between two different paradigms of music. And the one that challenged the mathematical dominance was the blues because the blues didn't believe a note should always be played in tune. The blues would bend notes. The blues would use notes that were not in the scale. And this led to a hundred year burst of creativity in which all of popular music learned about bending notes. They learned about sounds that couldn't be included in the scale. This not only influenced blues, it influenced jazz. It entered into country music. You had people yodeling and doing all these things you couldn't notate. Even when you listen to these singing competitions on TV, you find that the singers will always bend the notes. This didn't exist before the blues entered into the mainstream of popular music. So you see that mathematics does not have to dominate, and when mathematics is challenged by the entry of an African element, by the entry of a jazz element, by the entry of a blues element, it revitalizes the music. So I would suggest this is how we should look at the conflict today between music and math. We see these two paradigms. They're conflicting. Everybody wants to reduce things to the algorithm. But in a way, we need a new African revolution in our music. We need to understand not every aspect of music can be easily transformed into an algorithm. And the moment you try to reduce everything to math, there are all the things you leave outside. So let's embrace math, let's embrace the algorithm, but let's also realize the importance of the things that can never be contained in a simple algorithm and think that maybe even now in the current day, we need a new African influence, a new African revolution entering into our music so that we don't reduce everything to just number.